How was the absolute temperature scale discovered? So zero Kelvin represents absolute zero. Where did the Kelvin temperature scale come from? Well, whenever gases were being studied in the 1700s and 1800s, scientists were running tests on gases where they would do things like, for example, fix the amount of gas, fix the temperature, and then vary the pressure on the gas to see what happens to the volume. Or fix the amount of gas, so fix the number of moles of gas, hold the pressure constant, and see what happens to the volume of the gas as the temperature changes. It was through that specific kind of test that absolute zero, and thus the absolute temperature scale, was discovered. So the amount of gas is constant, pressure is held constant, but the temperature is being varied, and you're seeing what happens to the volume of the gas as a result of the temperature being varied. Okay, so imagine we've got two separate gases, two separate types of gases. So this is gas one, and this is gas two. And the amount of gas here is N1, N1 moles of gas one, and we've got N2 moles of gas two. N1 and N2 don't have to be the same. Okay, so first we wanna test gas one. Now, just for the record, these gases would be like a substance that at room temperature and pressure, that substance is a gas. So we're not talking about like water vapor here, where water is, is at room temperature and pressure is liquid. These gases at, at room temperature and pressure, standard atmospheric temperature and pressure, exist as gases. Okay, so we start with gas one. We pick a pressure. We're going to hold this pressure constant. And then we vary the temperature and see what happens to the volume. What we get is something like this. Okay, so we'll call this P1. That's the constant pressure. And we get this linear relationship, which is nice. I mean, it doesn't have to be linear. It, it could have been nonlinear, but we get this nice linear relationship here. And then note that we can only go so low because then because, of, because eventually the gas will condense. So around just a, the, a, a reasonably large temperature range, we vary the temperature at this constant pressure, P1, and we get this relationship here. And we're doing this with a constant N1 moles of gas 1. Okay, so now we change the pressure to another pressure, P2, and do the same thing. And we get this line here. This is at constant pressure, P2. And you can imagine that P1 is less than P2. That's why the volumes are bigger. The pressure is less. Higher pressure, smaller volume. Okay, so cool. We're getting this, this, these, these linear relationships. This all looks, looks interesting. So now we go to P3. The pressure is a little bit higher. And we get another line. Okay, so nothing out of the ordinary yet. We're just seeing this, this linear relationship between volume and temperature of a gas. So now we do the same thing with this other gas. We do the first test, say, at P4. Because the pressures don't have to be the same as these. Another test at P5. And another test at P6. Okay, now we could do this for another gas as well, a third gas, a fourth gas. And, and we, would, we would get this, this same outcome here, this linear relationship between temperature and volume of a gas. When you, when you hold the amount of gas constant and the pressure of the gas constant. But what's interesting is that for any gas that you do this for, there's something in common about every one of these graphs. If you extend these constant pressure lines all the way to volume is equal to zero, they meet at a common point. So for each separate gas, the pressure lines all meet at a common point when V is equal to zero. And furthermore, they all meet at the same value of temperature. Again, this is for each separate gas graph. They converge at negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. Now, just a reminder, there's no tests that were run in, in these regions here because that would be a condensed form of the gas. We're just extending these, these lines. But still, that's amazing. The point at which all these lines meet doesn't have to be at, at V is equal to zero. You know, those lines could meet anywhere. It just happens to be when V is equal to zero. And any gas that you do this for, 
exhibits the exact same behavior. All the lines meet at V is equal to zero and, and at the same value, the, at the same temperature value when V is equal to zero. And we only did three pressure values for each gas, but you can do as many different constant pressure tests as you want. It'll be the same result. And so the theory is that this temperature must be the lowest possible temperature. And that's where absolute temperature scales come from. An absolute temperature scale defines this negative 273.15 Celsius as absolute zero. That's why there's no such thing as a negative Kelvin temperature. The Kelvin scale, so you have absolute zero, and then each increment on the Kelvin scale is the same as, as a degree Celsius increment. So a change of one Kelvin is equivalent to a change of one degree Celsius. The Rankine scale is another absolute temperature scale. The Rankine scale is to degrees Fahrenheit as the Kelvin scale is to degrees Celsius. So you just convert negative 273.15 degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit, that's absolute zero on the Rankine scale. And then each notch on the Rankine scale is a degree Fahrenheit.